Hi everyone, it's a lovely day here in London, so uh, there's lots of daffodils out um, being sold for quite cheaply. So at the moment my apartment is just filled with these lovely daffodils and because uh, and it's such a nice day um, I've just been out walking in the park and uh, while reading or listening to the audiobook of bring up the bodies uh, because I, uh, I've, so I've just started this because I have finally, finally read Wolf Hall and uh, sort of Anna pushed me to do this because uh, when we made our video talking about our women's prize predictions uh, that I uh, haven't read this yet and uh, she's sort of making me feel very guilty that I, I, I hadn't read it yet and, and, uh, and made me realize how soon the third book in the trilogy is coming up so it's like oh if I want to read that third book I really need to get on and read these and, and I know a lot of people have been either reading this or rereading this uh, uh, and well I mean the first two books really and uh, and so yeah I've finally read this I have sort of mixed feelings about this mostly good I really enjoyed it overall but uh, but yeah have some mixed feelings about it I'm, I'm gonna talk about but uh, also read a number of other books in over the month of February um, some really good ones that I, I want to chat about first um, so first there is uh, Love and Other Thought Experiments by Sophie Ward. So this is uh, Sophie Ward's debut novel. And I have to admit, I have a bit of personal history with Sophie Ward in that uh, a few years ago, we were judges together on the Green Carnation Prize. And uh, it was really lovely um, getting together and, and chatting with her about all the, the books that were up for uh, the award that year and um, she had really interesting thoughts about them so it was it was great getting to know her and chatting with her for that reason um, but I was very initially very excited to meet her because um, Sophie Ward is an actress and uh, I grew up uh, watching a couple movies that that she was in so she was in Return to Oz where she was one of the characters that played Princess Mombi you know the enchantress type woman that has all the different heads and she's the the first woman that uh, that meets Dorothy when she comes up to her uh, but then also um, she was in the the movie Young Sherlock Holmes and um, she was the female lead in that and uh, and I just loved that movie when I was younger and uh, watched it over and over again <laughs> um, so um so yeah it was it was funny uh, sort of encountering her um, being a judge with her on this prize and having in the background of my mind like I grew up watching you that is a kind of crazy situation but um but yeah and um, so I was very excited to see she's just published her very first novel and it's really interesting different sort of novel and one that I really enjoyed by the end of it. Um, I have to admit at first I wasn't so sure about the story because it has a sort of strange structure where it's basically short stories but that are all very much linked to each other um, but each self-contained story uh, is a thought experiment where she takes a, a concept a sort of philosophical concept it's sort of like a, a like mind twister where you um, you're presented with a situation and it uh, and it makes you think more deeply about uh, life and existence and um, and yeah all these like sort of deeper questions uh, about life but um, she takes these uh, more abstract concepts but dramatizes them in a story and um, and so sees that play out in a real situation or how that might play out in a real situation and um, and the the novel mainly focuses on a, a couple a lesbian couple who want to have a child and um, and so about their process of going through and, and doing that um, but then follows them over many years and um, as well as a few people who are associated with them so some of the stories are from their perspectives some of the stories are from uh, the more peripheral characters perspectives um, some of them are from their child's perspective um, because it goes takes place over many years and um, so looks at sort of time and memory and and grief and uh, lots of yeah issues to do with family and of course love as it talks about in the title and uh, but um, through the lens of these different kind of philosophical thought experiments um, so yeah at first I, I thought like oh maybe this is too like high concept to work as a story but then as it went along I got really emotionally involved with the characters and where the story went and um, and some of the stories do have a much more sort of uh, 
I wouldn't say experimental, but kind of fantastical story like uh, style to them in that um, some are a bit more sci-fi, some are a bit more realistic. And um, yeah, it, so uh, it sort of plays with genre in that way as well. I don't know, I thought it was really interesting um, and yeah, really enjoyed it. So um, I hope she publishes more because yeah, it'll be exciting to see um, what else she does. Uh, then I also read The Water Dancer, which, of course, uh, a lot of people have been talking about and reading. Um, it was an Oprah's Book Club choice, and uh, it came out a number of months ago in the US, but only officially came out in the UK recently. And uh, yeah, so finally read this. And um, this was another novel that, like, at first I wasn't too sure about it because I, I, I felt like the story um, was maybe a bit too imminent imitate was imitating um, uh, Toni Morrison's uh, fiction or maybe you know showed too much influence of Toni Morrison in the the style of na narration and the way he was telling the story so it's about a, a man um, who is a slave on a plantation in pre-civil war times um, but who has a special ability called conduction where he's able to transport people over a long distance and um, so he becomes involved with the underground railroad movement and of course obviously with that skill he is able to to uh, assist in that in an uh, interesting way and, and interestingly they want to recruit him for sort of their own purposes and, and so um, yeah you, it's, it's interesting the whole like politics of, of that but then him also grappling with a lot of these personal issues and this was another story that yeah as the novel went on I felt more emotionally involved with it and saw how that you know this wasn't just an imitation of Morrison he's really doing his own thing in this novel um this uh, obviously it's another debut novel and um and I I also felt there was the a real strong influence of Charles Dickens or at least it, it sort of the the story felt slightly Dickensian to me of how because he's um also the son of the plantation owner um but his mother was a slave so um so there's that uh, that tension in that he's basically raised to be his uh, half brother's minder, um, who his half brother who is fully white and who is the sort of heir to this plantation, um, but who is a basically degenerate sort of horrible person. And um, but he um, here um, the um, he is very intelligent uh, as well as having this special magical ability um and uh and so you know is a much more worthier son to his father but obviously because of his race and his his mother um he's not able to have that place in the family that he should do so it's it's almost a it, that's why it reminds me of a sort of dickensian story of somebody who should have been um who is basically born into very lowly circumstances and um, through his ingenuity and intelligence is able to rise up and um, sort of over the course of a long period of time is able to survive in a way that people who were born to better advantage aren't able to survive in that way. And so I thought the story was really compelling in, in that way, um, but also in the way it looked at, at memory and what we choose to remember what we choose to forget and um and the 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 issues that are involved with that when we go through a lot of trauma in our lives and so yeah i i i was really moved by this novel at the end and and was really glad that i um i read it uh, i also read amer mcbride's new novel strange hotel and i've always been a fan of her fiction. So this is her only her third novel, um, but she has such an amazing reputation, and um, and uh, and I would say this novel is a lot less experimental than her previous writing, or or at least you know doesn't have that kind of uh, you know her almost trademark style of 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 writing in this sort of strange sort of uh, subconscious speech that she she's written in her past two books although her last book was only partly narrated in that in that sort of style but, uh, but anyway yes it's a strange hotel is written in a more straightforward style but the subject matter of it is is even more abstract than her previous books i think because um you're you're following the thoughts and experiences of 
of a woman, but uh, who is staying in many different hotels around the world. And you sort of follow it through this, this map where um, she'll list these cities and then have ticks behind them of, of where she's been and where she's not been. And, um, and, uh, and so, yeah, you follow her experiences in these hotels, but you don't really know why she's in these different cities or anything much about her past or her motivations, but you just get her uh, thoughts as she tries to navigate her experiences. It's, it's very, it's tricky to describe because in, in a way, like nothing much really happens in this novel, although things do later on in the novel and you sort of see that and are confronted by that. It's obviously a very inward looking, uh, very thoughtful novel. Um, so if you want a kind of meditative experience like that, and I know it's sort of a cliche, but I, I always am reminded of Samuel Beckett's writing when I read her writing because it's, uh, you, you get these moments of like very deep thoughtfulness, which are interspersed with uh, a lot of really funny humor. I mean, I think it, there, there are parts of this book that, uh, that do, where it's just a sort of twist of a way of looking at everyday experience, which is very funny and, and very blunt and straightforward also in a way, um, which I really appreciate. So I, I really enjoyed reading this novel. I mean, it definitely won't be sort of one of my favorite books of the year, but, and I really appreciated it, but, uh, but I, um, yeah, it was a really interesting experience and I'm glad, you know, she's still writing and publishing books because, uh, yeah, there's nobody really doing quite what uh, Amor McBride is doing at the moment. And uh, I also read Jenny uh, Ophel's uh, new novel, Weather, um, which I, I talked about already with, with Aunt Anna quite a bit. I almost called her Anna, but yes, Anna. <laughs> I, um, I talked about this with, with her, and so this follows the, the, uh, the, the life of a librarian, but in um, her sort of style, she gives sort of snippets of experience rather than a straightforward narrative that you can follow that has, um, again, like a, no a novel which doesn't particularly have any central plot, although the, the, the um, there are lots of things going on where um, this librarian, her her brother, has been struggling with addiction, and he's he's sober now, but um, but he uh, but yeah, he still has lots of problems and and has a new relationship, and um, and so it goes into details about that. But then also she becomes an assistant to a woman who's a kind of like guru and spokeswoman who who does all these engagements, um, and she and and. Uh, it, it's sort of, it's quite funny how it follows along her experiences with with her and her interactions with her, um, but also then larger issues to do with the environment um, that she's sort of worried about and people she encounters who are sort of uh, preparing for the worst and and uh, almost take that as a given that there's going to be a coming apocalypse which is going to lead to the end of the world and so people are like figuring out the best places to go in the world to find shelter um, after uh, the world all goes completely haywire and chaotic and all of that. And, um, and a lot of these encounters are sort of with people that she meets at the library and stuff. And, and uh, I was almost reminded of Susan Orlean's uh, novel, um, sorry, not a novel, it was a nonfiction book, her, her book, The Library Book, um, where she, uh, because she records a lot of of just the sort of absurd encounters that um, librarians sometimes have with patrons who ask them very odd questions, and um, to recount some of these in in here. Um, so, I yeah, I it's it's interesting how um, Anna was saying that she found this novel made her feel slightly panicky about these issues to do with the environment, and but I I sort of felt like it it um it wasn't really giving, I mean, it's not really giving any new facts in that way, but it's just giving a new perspective on that of somebody who's looking at all of this anxiety that a lot of people are feeling in society right now um, from a slight uh, slant in the way that she's looking at it and, um, and which it, is taking it seriously and is definitely feeling very worried about it, but also uh, almost having an ironic distance from it so that I, I just felt a lot of it um, came across as quite funny to me, um, like not in a sort of 
telling jokes way, but in a way that it's just, um, yeah, having that sort of ironic distance from it. Um, at least that's that's what I got from the novel. So anyway, I really enjoyed it, and I I, I think it's a great um, novel. Um, she it's so interesting her style of writing, and um, and I found it really effective. I've I've heard from some other people who who didn't appreciate it as much and found it a bit more gimmicky, but um, but it it really worked for me. Uh, and uh, and I also read Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melchor, um, which I talked about already because uh, in the long list of the uh, Booker International Prize, which uh, thankfully this, this novel made that list because I think it's a, a great book. Um, I and mean, it's not too surprising that it was chosen for the list with uh, uh, Valeria Luiselli on, on, the, um, on the, the judging panel because she's uh, also Mexican. Um, although, you know, obviously lots of other Mexican novels have been translated and published um, in the past year, but this is a really exceptional one, I think, in the way that it portrays a small town and a woman who has been murdered, um, who is uh, sort of referred to as the local witch, because she um, she sort of dabbles in these in the kind of uh, in making these sort of potions for for local people, especially local women and uh, local prostitutes who find themselves uh, pregnant and uh, want to. Um, uh, want to end their pregnancy, and so um, so she assists them in doing that, and uh, and so it's told from the perspective of a, no of a number of different young people who are associated with her, and uh, and yeah, and the the story just has such vigor to it, the way it's told, um, that it's there's such an intensity to the narration, um, that that I found it really mesmerizing and almost hypnotic in the way that it's told. Um, I I think it's so. It, it, it just, yeah, the, the story just completely gripped me. And in a weird way, it, it reminded me slightly of um, The Glorious Heresies, Lisa McNerney's novel, which uh, won the Women's Prize a few years ago, um, in the, the way that it portrays a city and uh, the sort of gritty underside of that city where there's lots of yeah, drug dealing and prostitution and uh, really rough um, behavior between uh, different people. But... Um, uh, but but in a way that which is quite sympathetic in that you can see um, yeah the the complexity of a number of the different characters' lives and um, but also you know very much their shortcomings and the their bad habits and um, yeah and the um, the the very difficult situations that they um, fall into and and uh, yeah I, I thought it was a really fascinating novel I, I think. Um, it should come with a, a warning that there's like there's there is a lot of violence. There's a lot of um, physical and sexual violence, so you should be aware of that um, before going to to read it. Um, to just be prepared for that. Um, but I I think it's a phenomenal novel. Um, I also read How Pale the Winter Has Made Us by Adam Scov Scoville, and uh, and uh, this is interesting. I got to go hear the author. Um, in conversation with Deborah Levy at uh, at Foyle's bookshop, and he was at the sort of launch of the book. He was um, he was giving a, a public reading from it, and they they had an interesting discussion about it. And what was quite interesting about the discussion was that Deborah Levy. Uh, even though she's a novelist, she was a lot of the questions she was asking him was like, you portray one of these characters in a certain way, and what is that character's backstory, and and did they really mean what they said here or something like that? Um, which is a very like direct question to ask a novelist, and you know usually writers want to be a lot more ambiguous uh, about their the the meaning of their work or their um or or what actually happens in the story um and so it's interesting that as Deborah Levy as a, a novelist would would ask him questions like that when you think she would um yeah be more sensitive to leaving those things um obscure or or you know um open for debate on the reader's part so that the reader can you know come to their own conclusions about it and yeah so um so that that was sort of funny but um but it was a uh, yeah it was a really interesting talk because obviously she's uh She's a fascinating person, and um, and yeah, and so the the story um, follows a um, a character named Isabel who's staying in the city of Strasbourg, and while she's there, she's been staying there with her partner, who um, and her partner leaves to go 
to South America for his work and she's about to leave when she gets the news that her father back in London has committed suicide and rather than go back to London and emotionally deal with all of that she chooses to stay in this foreign city of Strasbourg and uh, research the lives of a number of different people who have associations with the city like Goethe and Gutenberg and uh, and so she's uh, she sort of investigates the, the lives of a number of these these different real life people uh, and, and every once in a while you get these snippets of a um, either her reflecting slightly on her past or or snippets of, um, they may be text messages or they may be imagined uh, conversations she has with her mother um, who is very harsh and um, and they're, so like in the middle of these research, this research you'll, you'll get a little snippet of something saying like um, it's your fault that your father is dead or you know these very accusatory like horrible things and uh, and so and that just underpins all of this other information with uh, a real emotional undercurrent where you can feel that she's struggling with all of these things but isn't able to consciously come to grips with all of her emotions and and so it's an interesting way of portraying all of that I mean it re reminded me slightly of um, Jesse Greengrass's novel Sight in the way that it's um, it's it's a novel but it's sort of fiction combined with non-fiction because a lot of it is research and looking into these particular cases from history but then these cases from history because the character is so obsessed with them it's sort of reflecting on their own emotional circumstances um, in, in the moment so uh, yeah I, I found it really moving and um, and and a very like interesting take on looking at grief in that way but it's definitely a, a very glum novel I mean to be blunt it's a you know it, it's another very thoughtful novel that like if you're not in the mood for that type of book um, I think you probably wouldn't wouldn't uh, enjoy this 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 novel but um but uh, but but yeah it's um but if if you are and uh, and in the winter time I think it's a great time to to sort of be reflective like that and and uh, and thoughtful like that uh, then yeah you you might enjoy this book um, then I also read uh, the illness lesson by Claire Beams I, I buddy read this with Matthew Sharapa and uh, and it was it was interesting in having conversations with them about it as we were reading along because uh, we had quite different opinions of it as as uh, as I don't think he enjoyed it quite as much as I did whereas um, the deeper into the novel I got the more I appreciated it and enjoyed it so it takes place in a school at the uh, toward the end of the 1800s in New England and is uh, sort of playing upon how there were groups of people at that time um, known as transcendentalists who had um, uh, this particular philosophy, belief about the, the way that we experience the world and, and yeah, sort of interact with, with nature and, and, um, and who had uh, created a number of different communal experiences experiments many of which quickly failed because it was sort of intellectuals that would go and live on a farm and and try to live uh, a a different form of life which um which just didn't <laughs> because they they were people you know that had a lot of book smarts but didn't have a lot of practical experience it just didn't work out as well as it should and um and so yeah this um it's interesting how she gives an example of this but it takes place in the aftermath of one of these failed communal experiments where a father and a daughter who the father was one of the main uh, people who organized this community that failed and and even though that failed he's trying he has another idea to start a school for young women and um, and so he runs that with his daughter um, who uh, joins him as a teacher um, as well as another young man who is one of his followers who joins as a teacher as well and so they get uh, only like six or seven girls as their first students and as they're teaching these girls um, the girls come down with these symptoms of an illness uh, which uh, is a sort of joint hysteria uh, uh, but uh, but yeah um, manifests in, in in very frightening ways and um, and then uh, yeah and so the, the story goes from there and it gets very dark and very sinister and yeah I 
I, I thought it was very moving how she portrayed this and very artful how she portrayed it as well because there's a central metaphor of these red birds which come and flock around uh, the, the farm as they're living there and which are these sort of expressions of the, the girl's emotional state which they can't really express themselves or aren't allowed to express themselves. And, um, and yeah, uh, and which, uh, you know, aren't just beautiful, but are also quite frightening. Um, so yeah, the, it, it plays with all these things about um, coming of age and adolescence and the, the way that women are systematically um, controlled by, by institutions. I think they have a, a better idea about how women should be raised and treated rather than listening to the women themselves and, and, um, and really recognize them as complex and different individuals. and. And yeah, and an example of how um, you know institutional power works in that if there is a figure of perceived authority, um, people will follow them even if they realize that it, what they're doing is very immoral. Um, so it's it's sort of a look at the way power works like that within a, a system that is quite misogynistic and and uh, and so yeah, I found it really powerful in in that way and really enjoyed um, this this novel. I think it's very artful how how it's done. Um, and yeah, and so I finally read Wolf Hall. And yeah, there's obviously so much has already been said about this novel, and and um, and you know, and I I was able to get over that thing of not understanding the historical circumstances, you know, partly because I read that biography of Thomas Cromwell a few months ago. So I feel like I was equipped with that background knowledge and that definitely helped. I mean, I'm not gonna pretend that I completely understood all of the scenes and everything that was going on and everyone who was involved because there's lots of different characters, there's lots of uh, complex politics to the Tudor period and and the um, of the, the the English Reformation and uh, yeah so it's it's um it's there's a lot of intricacies to that and I'm sure I didn't get it all but I I was able to just keep reading on uh, as as it and that didn't bother me so much. So I did really appreciate the, the story and got into it and thought the way she portrays Cromwell is, is, is uh, I mean, I sort of got everything from it that I wanted from the biography really as in terms of sort of an emotional understanding of his life and his background and, and why he might be making some of the decisions that he does. I mean, I found it very haunting how there's a very strong scene in the beginning of the novel of him as a child who's almost beaten to death by his father and how this um, coming from these very humble beginnings um, sort of underpins all of his other actions as he goes forth in his life and, and rises to become one of the most powerful men in all of England and I thought that was all very moving and good and and the way that he he is sort of haunted as the way many of the characters in this novel are haunted throughout the book by uh, figures from their past who have died because there's lots of death um, obviously around this time in in England where um, there is plague and there's references to a lot of uh, sicknesses that that uh, like a, a fever that will come every year and wipes out large groups of the population but also lots of public executions because of uh, of all the religious strife that was going on and and um, so yeah I, I thought that was all really um, interesting and effective but at the same time I felt like my engagement with it could only go to a certain degree because I feel like this um it's it's um it's you know it's dealing with subjects and characters and people of sort of like noble birth um although obviously Tom, Thomas Cromwell isn't of noble birth but these like power plays between people of nobility who have these massive egos and obviously it's fascinating how that works and is historically important but at the same time I feel like these are all a lot of these people are very privileged and and like so why should I care about their their struggle for power and their and who gets what position I I feel like you know the it's it is fascinating the way that they'll sort of eat each other alive but at the same time like I I don't strive for that sort of like power or um yeah so so I can I can only have limited sympathy for characters like this so it's you know it's I, I sort of struggle with it in a way that 
that like I feel like it's unfair to criticize a novel for portraying characters that I you know it's almost like I'm saying like 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 well I don't like the characters so I don't, don't like the novel I'm not but I'm not saying that um it's more just that I feel like it can only have a limited sympathy for them because it's yeah, it's it's just not sort of uh, people that I I feel like uh, are necessarily deserving of more attention because even in their their own time, you know, they were huge egomaniacs and and um, and so have been written into the history books in the way that a lot of other people at that time weren't written into the history books. So usually, I enjoy historical novels that look at people from the past who you know aren't included in these historical accounts. Whereas, um, you know, obviously these people already have been well documented. And, but I do think it's great because Mantel gives a very different perspective on that history than has ever given, been given before. And, you know, really does something different with the historical novel. So I, I do think it's a great book, but, um, but yeah, that's just sort of my, my, complicated, uh, my complicated thoughts about, about, uh, about reading this, this trilogy. But, you know, I am really enjoying it. I am feeling very involved in it. And so am, you know, into bring up the bodies now. And, um, and yeah, and I'm trying to do that thing of, as, as I talked about in um, my previous video about big books that I want to read, that I'm, you know, listening to the audiobook this as well as reading a physical copy of it while I'm at home. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to continue reading along with this because, yeah, the third part is coming out this coming week. So I want to finish it before uh, the the third book comes out. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to... And so far, um, this I'm finding the style of this novel much more fluid and easy to read than um, than Wolf Hall. So it's, um, yeah, it's it's interesting how the styles of the, the two books different, so I'm um, differ in that way. So I'm uh, interested to see how she goes along with that. So yeah, let me know um, it, your thoughts about any of these books, if you've read them um, or if you're interested in reading them now and what else you've been reading in the past month. Um, let me know all of your thoughts about that and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye everyone.